Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. Today's another one of those early on in an expansion kind of days where we're going to be talking heavily about spoilers from the beginning. If for some reason you're still here and you haven't completed the campaign, I would switch off right away, although we are going to be talking about a lot of post-campaign content from Neomuna here, so if you're not looking to have all of that spoiled as well, I would switch off here too. All of that being said, we're going to jump right in with some spoiler stuff. And today I want to start with a question. Have you heard them? The whispers throughout Neomuna. That voice in the darkness. That voice, as we now know, belongs to a figure of darkness that has been whispered about for a long time. His name is Nezarek, and today we're going to be talking about who they are and what new information we've learned about them thanks to Lightfall. They are the source of these whispers, and today we will unravel everything to do with them. I don't expect that this will be the last time that we're going to be working on this topic either, and frankly I think it's going to be something worth looking at extensively as time goes on. At least, assuming that Nezarek is going to make an appearance in the raid, which is what everything in the expansion is pointing to thus far, and assuming that the raid is going to be of a similar narrative quality to Vow of the Disciple. Yeah, I know, keep the faith. There's still a decent chance of that, I think. So, in this video, we're going to quickly go over everything we know about Nezarek since before Lightfall. We're going to go over what's new to Nezarek's story in Lightfall, and then I'm going to give you a few of my thoughts on his evolving story. First, though, Let's talk about how we can access the alternate Nezarek dialogue again. Before I was able to publish yesterday's video, someone alerted me that you can actually get dialogue from Nezarek by using Nezarek's Sin, Nezarek's Whisper, or Delicate Tomb. Thanks again for that one, Joe. I wasn't able to update the video in time yesterday, but I was able to test out the glaive since then. And yeah, the new Nezarek dialogue plays whenever the weapon is equipped too, so I can absolutely confirm what all of you were telling me in the comments section was the case as well. So yeah, thank you again for all of that as well. Anyway, the point is that if you didn't know about this by equipping any of these items which are related to Nezarek, you will be able to unravel what's being said by the aforementioned unintelligible whispers throughout Neomuna. When wearing one of these pieces, it turns into actual dialogue that is comprehensible and is listed as being said by Nezarek. Thus far, from looking around the game, I've been able to get dialogue out of the Partition mission, the Thrillodrome Lost Sector, and Terminal Overload. I've also heard that you can potentially get his dialogue when doing patrols, but I've not seen that personally, so I can't confirm. We also get notes about Nezarek, throughout the campaign, and when you run into him, or at very least hear his voice, in the new Neomuna slash Vex Network Hypernet Current Strike, which, yeah, it features him heavily at least on your first run through. So if you're interested in learning more, because we will definitely need more time to get everything out there, go ahead and do some research yourself. Go and throw on the glaive and listen out for the whispers. If you do throw on the glaive, remember that you do have some alternatives. If you're running Arc 3.0 and you want a fusion rifle, you can use Delicate Tomb instead, which I've personally not tested, but everyone has told me that that also works. And if you're a warlock who likes void damage, go ahead and throw on Nezarek's Sin. Now, before we talk about any of the stuff that we learn in Neomuna, I'm going to go over a rather extensive refresher about who Nezarek is and what we know about them so far. And the point of that is we actually know a lot, and it's worth diving into the specifics because it gives us a lot of hints as to what's happening with Nezarek right now on Neomuna. So let's begin. Nezarek has been a long time mystery in Destiny 2, and has been around since D2 Vanilla, but before we get into any specifics, there are some broad basics that I think everybody should know, and those basics are as follows. Nezarek is, or rather was, a disciple of the Witness. He was responsible for the first attack on Earth during the Collapse, and the side bits of lore around the game also have a lot of indications that he has betrayed the Witness at some point. If you look at some of the names of the perks on the Delicate Tomb in particular, you get that indication. 
This, however, does not mean that he's on our side. Let's just say that he doesn't quite pass the vibe check. Anyway, it's also worth knowing that Nezarek's Pyramid is in fact the one that we discovered on the moon in Shadowkeep, and that the nightmares that we face on the moon are very much a defense mechanism linked to his pyramid. Now here's the thing, the nightmares aren't purely linked to Nezarek alone, I believe, because according to the Lightfall Collector's Edition, Elsie Bray, the Exo Stranger, sees a nightmare that originates from the Europan Pyramid, so this is something that is not purely within Nezarek's control, but it is something that is heavily associated with him, and it's a tool that he clearly uses a lot. Either way, those are the basics, and the lore around Nezarek is what we're going to go into now, and it starts from back in the days of D2 Vanilla. Something cyclical going on in with that one. Anyway, Nezarek was first mentioned in the Warlock exotic helmet that shares his name, Nezarek's Sin. The lore tab and description of this exotic are the first bits of lore that we ever got on the Disciple, and they're frightfully vague. Take a listen to this. He is that which is an end, and he shall rise again. Passage from Of Hated Nezarek, a pre-Golden Age text. He is that which is end that which covets sin, the final god of pain, the purest light, the darkest hour, and he shall rise again. When the guiding shine fades and all seems lost, he will call to you. Fear not. All he offers is not as dark as it may seem, for Nezarek is no demon, but a fiend, arch and vile in ways unknown. He is a path and a way one of many, and his sin, so wicked, so divine, is that he will never cower when dusk does fall, but stand vigilant as old stars die and new light blinks its first upon this fated eternity. Passage from Of Hated Nezarek so this passage is full of vagueness, but it tells us a few really important things that are wholly consistent with all the other lore that follows Nezarek around. First of all, it gives us a hint as to what his title seems to be, which is Hated Nezarek, God of Pain, The Purest Light, and The Darkest Hour. We see little hints as to most bits of this, the purest light bit is the exception. However, it does lead to interesting implications, but I'm not going to discuss anything because there is no law that supports anything that comes from that particular part of his title. The God of Pain and Darkest Hour bits, though, yeah, they definitely have some interesting tidbits that support their consistency. Nezarek, in a lot of Neomuna dialogue that I've captured or have heard about, seems to be enraptured by the infliction of pain. I didn't manage to get this particular one, but there is a moment with Legion soldiers attacking Neomona in the Terminal Overload event where he is really excited about the idea of you inflicting a bunch of pain and a bunch of chaos on the soldiers of the Red Legion. So yeah, that definitely doesn't pass the vibe check. And back in the Season of the Haunted, we actually see in the moment where we face the final boss of the season, the apparition of Kallus in the depths of Nezarek's old ship, that we're in an area that's known as the Chantry of the Darkest Hour, not only implying that it's a church or cathedral of some kind that we're fighting in, but also that it's dedicated to the Darkest Hour. And remember, that is part of Nezarek's title. This passage is also supposedly from a pre-Golden Age text, and that tells us a bunch of things. Firstly, it means that Nezarek was somehow able to infiltrate Earth and human culture before the arrival of the Traveler and the start of the Golden Age. This means that he must have sophisticated means of both infiltration and cultural influence given his place in literature from this passage being so seemingly consistent with what we discover about him later on, hundreds of years after his arrival, 
let alone the Golden Age collapse and the current eras of destiny. In particular, I want you all to remember the part about pain in Nezarek's description, as I think this is probably the most important part of Nezarek's character. They are described as a god of pain, and that is something that I think really plays into everything to do with Nezarek's character. And why? I think it's because this might be the reason for Nezarek's betrayal. So, hear me out, here's a potential scenario, and this is what I speculated about when I first read the lore tab years ago. I didn't know that Nezarek was a disciple, I don't even know if the idea of disciples was canon at that point, but I speculated that Nezarek was not someone who served the darkness. And the reason that I speculated that in particular was that the sword logic ultimately dictates a world without a need for pain because the weak are eliminated quickly and without suffering, because they don't serve the final shape, they don't deserve to exist. In the ideal world of the final shape, they don't even get the chance to exist in the first place. My speculation from years ago was that this was contrary to Nezarek's desires. If Nezarek is a final god of pain, then the final shape is the precise thing that he'd want to avoid. You'd want to be able to sit there and have life slowly struggling and crawling through a painful existence. And that is not what the final shape dictates. It dictates efficiency, it dictates finality, and it dictates some kind of twisted perfection, but it doesn't necessarily dictate pain. Years later, and we understand that the witness is actually the darkness, as we would put it, or rather, the witness is a force that has been using darkness and is responsible for our collapse. And I couldn't help but remember this line that the witness says during the campaign, and it is all about pain. Take a listen to this. Our hold over the veil has been temporarily loosened. You fear loss. Remember, your fear brings you pain. We know pain. Our purpose is its end. The witness all but confirms that idea that the existence of pain is unnecessary. It gives the idea that the final shape is supposed to be perfect and without pain, because ultimately that is kind of what really the final shape is about. It's about the final endgame for the universe, and pain should not be a part of it. Its purpose is the end of pain. This is also consistent wholly with the lore that we get from the Unveiling lore book in the initial discussions and argument between the Gardener and the Winnower, an argument that essentially states that the gardener was dissatisfied with the shape of the universe as it was always repeating and always the same. But the winnower knew that that shape was necessary, because otherwise the other shapes it could potentially be led to suffering, and when that suffering was going on, it was needless and pointless. This is the space in which Nezarek would totally exist, and this is why I think Nezarek, who at one point we know was a disciple, betrayed the witness. This, I think, is the key moment. But it also gives us a key explanation as to why the might have then become a disciple. If you think about it, yes, the witness is absolutely the last person that Nezarek would want to succeed. But at the same time, it's also the thing that would be able to feed Nezarek the most pain. You see, as long as the witness was still chasing the traveler, the cycle would repeat itself forever. You would have civilizations raised up by the Traveler, engorged on the light and given chances to progress and create societies full of weakness, and that weakness would then be painfully wiped away en masse in extinctions by the Witness, and Nezarek would exist and feed in that kind of space, where pain was plentiful. And so it makes perfect sense that Nezarek would willingly become a disciple just so long as the Witness never truly achieved the final shape. This is where I think the betrayal would have happened. Years later, we have these lines that have kind of given us an idea that this is what might have gone down. 
That final battle above Earth at the end of the first collapse that created the end of a predictable cycle for the God of Pain is probably what forced its betrayal. So there's a really fascinating set of ideas there that we just have to dig into. Now, that's all speculative stuff, and that all comes from the first ever thing that we got about Nezarek, Nezarek Sin. And from there, there really weren't many mentions of Nezarek for a very long time. In Forsaken, in the Drifter's lore book, we did get Shin Malfa mentioning the fact that the Drifter had mentioned old legends, in particular the fourth tomb of Nezarek, but we got no further context on that, and Nezarek, for the most part, as a result, remained an enigma for a very long time. It didn't seem like there would be any further interactions with his lore, and it seems as though he was just going to be another bit of background context that really didn't have any kind of explanation. It is interesting, however, to note that in a strange way, Nezarek was also around in Shadowkeep, considering that the nightmares were spawned by his pyramid ship. Even if he is never mentioned by name once in the campaign, his influence is everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. But either way, our next real mention of Nezarek would actually be during the Year of the Witch Queen and in the Season of the Haunted, when we'd be venturing onto the Leviathan, which had positioned itself above the moon, and in particular was drawing power from Nezarek's Lunar Pyramid. This was all at Callus's behest, and the power was seemingly being used in order to allow Callus some form of transfiguration, some form of transformation into a servant of the Witness, into a disciple that is closer to the Witness's vision of the final shape. But here's the thing, we intervened a lot in that season, and we did so using the Nightmare Harvester that Eris Morn had created. The Nightmare Harvester not only managed to pull Nightmare energies into it consistently, but also, of course, it was a great source of loot. And what was one of the pieces of loot that we would retrieve from the activities that involved the Nightmare Harvester? None other than a certain Arc Glaive that I'm sure some of you have equipped right now. Nezarek's Whisper. The lore tab for this glaive reads as follows. Wisps of soul fire swirl amid the geometric growths of stasis that jut from the dusty cavern floor, the sundered remains of hive knights and thrall frozen within the crystals. Detritus of the recent battle crunches under Eris's boots. Ahead, the stark angles of the lunar pyramid rise before her. Red phantoms hang in the air and shimmer like specks of dust against its enormity. Raising her ahamkara bone to her lips, Eris blows across its surface as if she were extinguishing a tiny candle. The world around her blurs and bends, and then she is elsewhere. The heart of the pyramid. A veiled statue towers over Eris, vaguely feminine in form, though she is not convinced of its apophenian silhouette. She raises her soulfire shrouded Ahamkara bone again. Stasis encrusts its surface, much as it had years ago when she first harnessed such power. Eris turns to inspect the vast interior of the pyramid. It is quiet. It is dead. Not unlike the one in Savathun's throne world. Her eyes narrow. She clutches the Ahamkara bone in her hand again, and... She is elsewhere. A chamber. It is cavernous. It is dark. Strange, bisected statues of stratified minerals line the cathedral-like walls and culminate at the far end before a yawning opening that empties into perpetual nothingness. On the floor, a length of unidentifiable metal caked in centuries of dust catches her eye. A glaive. Eris lifts it into her hand. Striations of red illuminate on its surface and throb like a heartbeat. The glaive's power feels faint, distant, and yet an ember of something terrible still burns within. Where are you? Eris whispers into the air. There is no reply. 
Now, it isn't confirmed by all of this, but when Eris ports into the pyramid, I think it's fairly clear that she actually ports into the Chantry of the Darkest Hour, based on the bisected statue's description and the giant cavernous space that opens up into perpetual nothingness. I think it's also the case that if this glaive was there, it may well have been Nezarek's property, or perhaps a relic crafted for him in honor of something that had happened, perhaps when he became a disciple. Remember that glaives have a specific importance and reference that is tied to the witness and the darkness of its forces, and that's because the glaive is a weapon designed originally by the Lubraeans, and the first disciple Rolk, the last of the Lubraeans, uses his own glaive, Lubre's Ruin. This is the design from which all glaives originate within Destiny's specific weapon archetype. So it's possible that the glaive was a gift to confirm Nezarek's place as a disciple. In fact, that's exactly what the law says. The flavor text of the Nezarek's Whisper Glaive states, Rise, disciple, and bear this gift with pride. That's a quote from Rulk, Disciple of the Witness. So presumably, this is the point at which Nezarek became a disciple of the Witness and was gifted the glaive from Rulk. Before we touch on anything else though, I wanted to touch on something that I haven't seen anyone talk about, and that's the Tormentors from Lightfall. Very often, the most elite Tormentor bosses that we face within the campaign of Lightfall and the post-campaign content have the title Imprint of Nezarek. In enemy terms, this means that these Tormentors are meant to be kind of similar to Nezarek in a way. I'm bringing this up to you after talking about Season of the Haunted, because if you remember the Season of the Haunted's main activity, you might remember that it was the Nightmare Harvester event that we had around the Castellum. And then there were also the Sever missions, where we would be able to venture into the underbelly of the Leviathan and help our various companions to deal with their traumatic nightmares, the memories that they were being haunted by. In both of these instances, when the Nightmare Harvester gained enough Nightmare Essence, a weapon was spontaneously created from the Harvester that the Guardian can then use. And what was this weapon, you ask? It was a scythe. And what weapon do the Tormentors use? Scythes. So perhaps the Tormentors do in fact look pretty similar to Nezarek in some term. Maybe it's purely their arms or armaments, but maybe there's more to it. I think that the Tormentors are very deliberately designed with Nezarek's strength in mind. And also, what is it to be in torment? It is to experience some kind of pain. So, a Tormentor being related to Nezarek? A god of pain? It's not too out of the question. And the design aesthetic also certainly matches Rolk in terms of being very disciple-like. There is a lot there, and I feel like we haven't seen the last of Tormentors out of the Legendary Campaign and the Shadow Legion. I feel like they may turn up in the raid if it is indeed something that is related to Nezarek. Moving on from the Season of the Haunted, we got a lot more lore about Nezarek in the Season of the Plunder, where we would actually be going out and seeking the different artifacts of Nezarek. These reliquaries would actually turn out to be powerful fragments of the Disciples' own body which had been carved up by the Elixni crew that was originally under the command of Mithrax's mother. These different relics were distributed to various pirate lord Elixni, and Mithrax himself used one to empower himself and to become the leader of such a crew. These relics contained a fragment of the Disciples' power, and it's not confirmed, but it is seemingly the case that each of these relics was one of the quote-unquote tombs of Nezarek, for some reason, the Witness was also searching for these relics at the time of the Season of the Plunder, and so it sent Eremis out to search for them and find them before we could. By the end of the Season of the Plunder, the Lucent Hive of Savathun were also looking for them, but the reasons why aren't specifically stated. It's here that we also learn more about the lore of Nezarek from the different relics. The seventh relic recovered comes with dialogue from Ido. That dialogue tells us that the Cryptarch's archives held information on Nezarek's action during the Golden Age from second-hand sources. 
These actions supposedly included Nezarek leading the Witness's first assault on Earth during the Collapse. After the Traveler defeated the attack, Nezarek's pyramid supposedly crash-landed on the moon, and that's the reason why it was there all along. Ido also told us about a potential way to harness the power of Nezarek's relics, though instructions were not given. The final relic that we recovered also came with Ido dialogue related to Nezarek, and it told us about how there was an ancient dirge from the Dark Age of Humanity that spoke about a curse of Nezarek. The curse was apparently something that drained the life of the user. But that's all rumor. Totally nothing could come from that, right? R right? Anyway, uh, the season ended with Mithrax being able to make a breakthrough with the different relics of Nezarek. He used them to draw a powerful infusion of darkness out of the relics and their core, and this was something that was able to return Osiris from his coma and recover some of his memories. I've talked about this before, but hilariously enough, the Ness Cafe slash darkness tea idea that's all made with infusions of the relics does make sense, especially now that we know that psychic energy and memory is some of the key important powers of darkness. It makes sense that it would restore someone's memory. I think also it's worth remembering that these visions that Osiris then had after the infusion were what led us to Neomuna, and whilst everyone is worried about the influence of Savathun on those visions, I don't think anybody has quite tapped into the idea yet that these could have been the influence of Nezarek. So, I'm just saying, this could all be part of Nezarek's plan, we just don't know. And speaking of which, now we're here on Neptune, and suddenly this mysterious voice has started to appear in the back of everyone's comms. It's most of the time going to come across as merely disembodied and unintelligible whispers. But through a lot of points in the campaign, Nezarek is either teased heavily, mentioned by name, or even just speaks. Off the top of my head, there are several tormentors throughout the campaign that have that name, Imprint of Nezarek. Some of these even appear in the post-campaign content, such as the tormentor that you find on the Typhon Imperator during the final warning exotic quest. We then get a Neomuna Civil News Bulletin, which is very easy to miss, but it does mention Nezarek by name again. Take a listen to this. I'm Jisoo Colorando, reporting for Neomuna Civil News. Cloud Strider Nimbus reports that recent cloud arc fluctuations are the result of new security measures to guard against intrusions. The Cloud Strider credits the Earth's guardians for contributing personnel toward the dangerous operation. Despite this, more citizens have experienced nightmares. One name common to all? Nezarek. So that's not ominous at all. Following up after that, we also have the whole series of dialogue bits that you get from the Hypernet current strike on your first playthrough in the campaign. That dialogue is as follows. The next portal is clear. Let's follow those taken and remove them from the system. Hey, Guardian. I'm not sure if this is because of the taken, but I'm starting to get a lot of weird claims of power. Screams, weird voices, nightmares, you name it. The Cloud Arc is built on the energy field produced by the Dale. It's resilient, but not impenetrable. A backdoor wouldn't be impossible. Hopefully, getting rid of whatever is at the center of this will shake all that weirdness out of the system, too. Hopefully. Guardian, it looks like you're getting closer to the source of the problem. That track nearby looks like your best bet. Let's just hope it's stable. Oh, finally. What? What was that? Such a fragile space. This will do. Oh, so much pain and fear within the darkness here. It's so satisfying. I will consume it once more. Did you both hear that? Was that the voice the citizens have been mentioning? This is far too similar to the nightmares we encountered on the Leviathan. We will need to confront this. 
But for now, we need to locate the access point and stop any attempts to weaken the veil. This is the access point. Let's get rid of that Taken before it opens a path into the Cloud Arc. Guardian. We must finish our preparations to ensure Callus's defeat. This prison in between. It will shatter. But I need power. I am pain. I am terror. I am Nezorak. Oddly enough, we can discern what these whispers are when we hear them in this strike first, but in all future instances where we hear Nezarek, they return to being unintelligible whispers. From here we can start to see all the different unintelligible whispers from around Neomuna, and I think we can certainly learn a few things from them. So let's go ahead and talk about each of them. I don't have recordings for all of them, because these are all from personal experience, and I don't always have recording because I need drive space. But two things that I have absolutely heard, and I've seen other people talk about, from around the experience of the expansion, are as follows. There is one recording where Nezarek talks about their wish to inflict pain upon the Shadow Legion Cabal, and there is another where he talks about how Scions used to worship him. Now, these two records do tell us some pretty simple facts about Nezarek at this current moment in time. First of all, he is definitely still opposed to the Witness. He wishes pain on them, even if it's us carrying it out by proxy. And pain might be his jam, but he seems very excited to see us doing it, which tells me that he's no fan of the Witness and what they're currently trying to do. The whole other thing about Scions worshipping him, though, is totally fascinating. If he isn't just referring to us by some other title, which would be confusing, and he is actually referring to Scions as a species, then he absolutely is tipping his hand as to how powerful he is. Nezarek is probably showing us here how he operated during his days as a disciple. He probably infiltrated a bunch of different worlds and a bunch of different cultures, specifically so he could infect the culture of that species with a variety of forces that would enable them to create literature, or even faith that would ultimately help him to accomplish his aims of becoming more of a god of pain. And apparently, this has happened not just to Earth, but if that last quote is to be taken as the Scions as a people, it's also happened with them. And so clearly he's very skilled in this regard. He has become a cultural artifact of many cultures, it almost makes him seem like some kind of eldritch old god, something that is indescribable and yet comes up in every culture over and over again. Now, as for the lines that I have recorded, I'm going to go back through my archive and dig out all these clips, but here they are all bit by bit. First of all, there's this clip here. I'll be totally honest with you, I don't know what this could mean, but it does imply that there's some kind of infectious corruption of darkness that Nezarek is capable of, and the fact that everyone is hearing his voice seems to align with this idea pretty well, but the idea that Nezarek is able to burst from our own shadows, shred them to pieces and then replace them, it's a scary notion, it seems very uh, offensive in the most literal sense of the word, not offensive as in you said an awful word, offensive as in literally it's aggressive, it is on the offense. Next up we have this line. Deal with that 
later. This line, along with the dialogue from the deterministic chaos mission, is really an important clue as to what motivates Nezarek. So I'm going to go ahead and replay a few things so that we can discuss that. First of all, I'm going to replay what he said in Hypernet Current, and I'm also going to play what was said in the deterministic chaos mission. Okay, so here's that dialogue. The fail. So, the witch didn't ruin you during her escapade. Good. Oh, finally. What? What was that? Such a fragile space. This will do. Oh, so much pain and fear within the darkness here. It's so satisfying. I will consume it once more. This prison in between. It will shatter. But I need power. I am pain. I am terror. I am Nezarek. Okay, so what does all of this seem to tell us if you knit it together? Well, first of all, it tells us that Nezarek is envious of the fact that the Neomuni have the Veil in possession, and that he personally is also seeking the Veil. We don't know what the hell the Veil is definitively, but we do know one thing that Rasputin was able to tell us at the end of the Season of the Seraph, and that was that it is an incredible source of paracausal energy. We also see that he's glad that Savathun's escapade, or the Witch as he calls her, hasn't tampered with the Veil in some way. This escapade, by the way, was Savathun hiding the Veil away on Neptune. So what does Nezarek want with all that paracausal power? Well, I think based on what we hear in Hypernet Current, that he's trapped and that he wants it so that he can escape. Let me explain. Nezarek talks about the desire he has to feed on the pain and fear within the darkness once again. This goes on during the Hypernet Current Strike, in which we see a bunch of Taken trying to use the Vex network as an insertion point into the Cloud Arc. We ultimately do stop this attempt, but in the process of the strike, Nezarek calls this place a fragile prison, and that he is within it and will shatter it when he has more power. At first glance, and this is what I believe is the case, this seems to imply that Nezarek is contained within the Vex network now for some reason, and somehow is surviving in a bodiless state. This also makes some sense because of the Deterministic Chaos mission. If you also read the lore tab of Deterministic Chaos, it mentions the idea of being disembodied and yet somehow surviving death. And yeah, that kind of fits really well. Uncannily well, considering that the square brackets aren't necessarily confirmed to be Nezarek, but they might well be. For those of you that didn't see yesterday's video, essentially, Deterministic Chaos also gives us a hint as to why he might be seeking the Veil. For the really quick summary of it, we are pursuing in that mission data on the Heart of the Black Garden, which as it turns out, was a failed copy of the Veil created by the Vex of the Black Garden. Nezarek might have wanted it for the same reason that he wants the Veil. It's a source of incredible paracausal power, and just in the same way that Nezarek's forces in the Hypernet Strike seem to be taken, it seems odd that the Taken then invade the Black Garden to pursue a copy of the data of how the Vex of the Soul Divisive created the Heart of the Black Garden, data that is apparently a copy of the Veil. Yeah. For those of you who haven't connected the dots, I think the Taken in that mission and the Taken within the Hypernet Current Strike are all controlled by Nezarek and not by the Witness. I say this also because they end up fighting the forces of the Vex within the Black Garden, and those Vex, as best we know, are under the control of the Witness, meaning that it makes a fair degree of sense as to why these otherwise allied forces would be attacking each other. But there's clearly a degree to which Nezarek has already succeeded in influencing the Cloud Arc even if he hasn't escaped into it, 
out from the Vex network. And I think that it's important to understand that because again, Neomunas citizens are continuously getting nightmares. They're experiencing his whispers in the back of his comms and they are all hearing his name. Nezarek must still have an access point somewhere that links the Cloud Arc to the Vex network. And where might that access point be? I'm not kidding, it's an old arcade. Yes, it's the Thriller Drome. Why is this an old access point? And why does this even connect to the Cloud Arc? It's an arcade. Well, take a listen to the opening dialogue when you do a playthrough of that Lost Sector first. I'm detecting a major Vex force inside, Guardian, and lots of utility access. We should find out if this building is critical infrastructure. Sam, are you on comms? Yeah, what's up, little bud? We have Vex fortified in a large structure on the waterfront. Let me just find you on the security feeds and... Whoa! Are you in the Thriller Drone? I missed that place! It was the premier destination for extreme esports. What? Like video games? Extreme esports. Sam, there's a Vex portal accessing the building's mainframe. Oh, that's super bad. The drone's got cloud arc root access to help it crunch cycles. It what? We've got to get in there and stop it, Guardian. Okay. So there's that. It uses the Cloud Arc and the power of it to run cycles of esports faster. I don't know, but it's connected is the point. Now take a listen to this Nezarek dialogue from the same Lost Sector. So it appears that Nezarek is implying that he is able to corrupt individuals through the same Thrillodrome as it lulls them into a state of... I don't know what the word is actually. Sameness, perhaps? Ignorance? Apathy? Relaxation? Either way, the implication is bad enough and the fact that the Thrillodrome is linked to the Cloud Arc to help aid in its calculations means that this is likely how Nezarek is infecting the minds of the people with nightmares and how he is getting into our comms. I think we can also make a guess as to what Nezarek's real move is going to be. I think Nezarek wants to escape so that he can form a proper physical body again, given that his old physical body has been thoroughly dismembered by the Elixni. His consciousness is still intact, but there are several questions with all of this. Namely, if he is residing within the Vex network, which seems more than likely, how would a source of paracausal power such as the Veil help him to reincarnate into a physical body? And also, how did he get into the Vex network in the first place? Those questions are worth answering, but I'm actually going to end things here, because I believe that we are nowhere close to done with Nezarek. I'll leave them for a future video. All I have to say is that I would be astounded if Nezarek isn't in the raid in some capacity, and if he is, Expect him to face us as he tries to enact this plan of reincarnating and regaining a physical body. Hell, perhaps he will momentarily succeed and be the final boss. I don't know that for certain. I don't think anybody knows except for people who've been awfully data mining and I've not looked at that stuff either way. I just know it happens. No matter what, try and avoid raid spoilers if you can, because otherwise that might spoil the surprise. And... Row on Nezarek's Whisper, look out for the whispers, look out for the unintelligible comms and see what they say. And if there's a line I missed that you've heard that you can remember or you have recorded or something along those lines, post what it was down below in the comments section. Let's see if we can crowdsource some stuff that I might have missed. Because you know what, the more we know, the better we will understand Nezarek going forward. And there is clearly a lot of mystery to be had here. But... That's all from me for today. This was a long video and I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, it took a lot of effort to get this all done. I was editing all this myself, you can probably tell by my more scuffed editing compared to Martin's fine stuff. If you did enjoy it, go ahead and leave a like. 
If you want to go ahead and tell me more about what you found from Nezarek, again, the comments section is open down below. But if you want more Destiny content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership as always is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Baif. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.